Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here is your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam, and welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham, coming at you today nearly live. We're in Ottawa, Ontario, at Carleton University for, I think, the third time we've been at Carleton to, to do a podcast, and I always love coming down here because uh, it's such a nice little campus and very nice community compared to the downtown uh, hubbub of you, Ottawa, so it's always fun to be here. And we're at the Carleton University Art Gallery as part of Northern Scene and our Northern History Week here at activehistory.ca for one of the uh, visual art shows and it is called Dorset Scene and it's uh, looks at the art of Cape Dorset and we're here with the co-curators of the exhibit uh, Leslie Boyd who has worked with West Baffin the West Baffin Cooperative and the former director of Dorset Fine Arts she has a background in the history of the co-op movement in the north and Sandra Dick the director of the Carleton University Art Gallery who has a Master's of Arts in Canadian Art History and has been with the gallery for almost 20 years and uh, the director for the past year with a new mandate. So welcome to the podcast, Leslie and Sandra. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. So first off, uh, Sandra, we'll just talk a little bit about the the art gallery itself. And we had the chance before we started recording to walk through it. Uh, beautiful gallery, and the show is uh, obviously terrific. But in general, just sort of what is this Carleton University Art Gallery and what's the mandate you have? Uh, so the Carleton University Art Gallery has been in existence since 1992, so just over 20 years, uh, yeah, just over 20 years now. Um, and we generally show largely Canadian art and often work created since uh, 1942, which is the year that Carleton History, Carleton University was founded. But we have quite a broad, uh, wide-ranging program, so we do, we focus a lot on Inuit art. We show a lot of Indigenous artists, so First Nations artists from across Canada, sometimes internationally. And we also show quite a bit of contemporary art. So our Mm -hmm. focus, I would say, is largely contemporary, but we mix in the occasional historical exhibition, sometimes uh, European historical, but often Canadian historical. Mm -hmm. And Dorset Scene is a good example of really an exhibition that mixes the historical and the contemporary together in a very nice kind of encapsulated way. Mm. So is is that what you would say maybe distinguishes it from other galleries in, in the city? Well, we're the only university art gallery right. in the region, um, so we are unique. Shot, shot at you, Ottawa. Yeah. <laughs> Shots well, fired. Very interesting. Yeah. No, not a shot. <laughs> not a shot, Sean, just a factual statement. So what is interesting is that University of Ottawa has a studio program and no mm. gallery. Right. And Carleton University Art Gallery has no studio program but has, sorry, Carleton University has no studio program but has an art gallery. Right. So it's an interesting mix. Um, and uh, so anyway, so back to just to say that we are the only uh, university art gallery in uh, the region on both sides of the river. Um, and I would say that we are distinguished in one sense by the scholarly ambition of our exhibitions. We put quite a bit into the interpretation in terms of intro panels and extended labels and really uh, very well researched uh, exhibitions. Hmm. Now, I have a quote from uh, when you were. Uh, I don't know what's the right word. Installed probably isn't the right word. Uh, appointed. Appointed yeah. as the uh, director here. Uh, that I found really interesting, uh, given that the gaze of this podcast tends to be in the historical. Uh, so, quote, I'm excited about deepening our engagement in a range of communities. I'd love for the gallery to serve as a third space, neither home nor work, that functions as a forum for dialogue between diverse communities and presents a challenging roster of exhibitions of both contemporary and historic art. Now, I think it's interesting that art can serve as this lens through which we can examine history. Uh, so I'm just wondering what both of your thoughts would be on how does art contribute to our historical conversations that we have, uh, not just in this country, but really around the world? Well, I think this exhibition, Dorset Scene, is an excellent example of how art can serve as a lens on history. Um, the exhibition is really about charting the development of the community and through the eyes of its own artists how they look at their own lives and it's you know and the lives of the the life of their community it's significant milestones uh the arrival of christianity for example or um everyday life or the life of the artist um simple moments that happen in inside a house with your family 
Um, these are all very, you know, very many moments that make up what we might consider to be history. Mm -hmm. um, and that's charted very clearly um, and quite passionately by these artists. So, I don't know, Leslie, do you want to mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's that connection between, well, art as a lens for viewing history is obvious in an exhibition like this. I don't think it always is. Right, yeah. I don't think all art necessarily... In, you know, looks back at history or mm -hmm. artists are necessarily interested in their own history. Yeah. But this exhibition certainly is. But mm -hmm. it's a very um, identifiable history mm -hmm. and very contemporary history. We're really only looking at the development of the modern community here. Right. So we can take that back to uh, the late 50s and early 1960s. Mm -hmm. So that's the historical period that we're interested in, mm -hmm. and we're interested in the development of the modern community. I mean, uh, but what's interesting about some of the contemporary artists in this show is that uh, aspects of their longer-term history, for instance, their relationship to the land and its resources and hunting, we're talking about a hunting culture, are still very much a part of their contemporary history. And these artists, for the first time, are incorporating... Uh, well, actually, no. I mean, uh, the older Cape Dorset artists certainly looked at their uh, land-based traditions. A lot of their prints and drawings were based on that. Uh, but these uh, artists have grown up in an entirely different time and reality, and yet they're incorporating their, what we would call, traditional history. Right. So this is a very obvious mm -hmm. example where you know, history is... Uh, important uh, and uh, conscious um, in the intent of the artist and the show. Mm. Yeah, it seems like, th and just walking through it, it seems like this is a great example of this discussion, this dialogue yeah. between the historic and the, and the contemporary. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, the, the show is titled Dorset Scene, and Dorset Scene spelled S-E-E-N, as opposed to Northern Scene, which is S-C-E-N-E. We did uh, think of it's that. It's a play on words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so d it's the art of uh, Cape Dorset. Uh, so first of all, where is Cape Dorset for anyone who doesn't know? Because I had to look it up last uh, last night. Cape Dorset is on the southwest tip of Baffin Island. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in an area uh, in a uh, area of land called the Fox Peninsula. Mm -hmm. It's actually its own little island mm -hmm. off of the mainland of Baffin Island. So right. the community of Cape Dorset is on an island that's connected to the mainland uh, by a land bridge at, uh, at low tide. Uh, it's called Kingite uh, by the people who live there, and that word describes the topography uh, surrounded by high, rolling uh, hills, uh, almost mountains, but not as majestic as, you know, the fjords of Pangertung. Uh, so that's where it is. Uh, the community, um, uh, the people from that area, the South Baffin Coast, are known as uh, Sikusilarmut, and Cape Dorset is w only one small community that uh, grew up around the Hudson's Bay Company post that was established there in 1913. What is the makeup of the community? Like, who, who, who's living there? Is it mostly Inuit, Inuit Aboriginal? Abs in, in, just in low, Inuit. Just Inuit. Yeah. Who are just who who you know over you know thousands of years and evolution. Inuit I mean, I have to sort of the settled there. Yes, Inuit yeah. from the South Baffin region. The Sikusilarmutes uh, settled in three communities: Cape Dorset, Lake Harbor, which is now known as Kimirut, and Ikaluit which mm. is the capital, right. now the capital of Nunavut. So those, uh, it, before the advent of communities, uh, Inuit lived in uh, camps, largely clan-based camps, dispersed along the coast, uh, and with the effort to bring them into settlements, uh, those uh, groups, who are all culturally related, uh, came together in the community. Mm. Now, Leslie, your background is rather interesting because you've lived uh, in Cape Dorset uh, and you're not a local to Cape Dorset so I'm just wondering where your interest in the community came from and how you ended up uh, there. being there. Yeah. I went there in 1980 when I was 23 when I finished university. Uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with a degree in sociology. <laughs> uh, I had an interest in community development I was a child of the 70s, so yeah. you know we were all uh, 
interested in a lot of us in making a contribution, saving the world if yeah. possible. <laughs> Um, and I did not want to stay in the city. Um, a bit of wanderlust runs in my family. So I put out the word that I would like to get out of town and uh, uh, work for a summer, um, make some money. And uh, it was serendipitous, actually. I had a, I had arranged to go to the Western Arctic, to Yellowknife, and I was going to uh, maybe be a cook on the developing pipeline there or something. Mm. I didn't really care. <laughs> uh, but I met, through a family connection, someone who worked for the West Baffin Co-op. And um, we were set up, and it was a summer job in 1980. That's all it was intended to be. <laughs> I was 23 years old. And I got there, and I had, uh, you know, a sort of wonderful summer. I got involved with this organization, which was much more interesting than I ever thought it was going to be. And at the end of the summer, uh, they asked if I would like to come back, and I realized there was just endless possibilities mm -hmm. for me there. So, you know, what, what was originally a summer job turned into my life's work. It's all come together now with Dorset Scene, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, you know, the show obviously we, we sort of touched on a little bit, but what is the, the if you had to describe the show, uh, what, what is the show about? One sentence description <laughs> would be uh, artists of Cape Dorset looking at their own community, hmm. and this is a show that's never been done. So the key uh, reason that we got interested in doing this exhibition was that. As I'm sure you know, the um, West Baffin Eskimo Cooperative was founded in 1959 and for the last 50 plus years has been issuing a very high quality fine art prints. Um, and Leslie talked a little bit about the history of the, the community, but this print shop and the experiments in printmaking were happening at the very same time that many people were coming from the outlying clan based camps into Cape Dorset. And many of these people became involved in the art making experiments that were going on it became hugely internationally successful and that is how the world knows Cape Dorset is through mm. these prints but what has been dramatically lacking in these prints are images of the community itself mm. people's everyday life the architecture technology transport religion family life and that's what um, motivated us to do this exhibition so there's not one print in the exhibition it's all drawings mm. and sculptures so every year many many drawings were made by the artists of Cape Dorset but only a very few were made into prints right. so there are many drawings that we uh, we could select from for this exhibition but um, it, for the contemporary artists it's largely contemporary artists drawings are the the art form that's very much in demand now mm. more than the prints and large-scale ambitious contemporary style drawings because you said something like what a hundred thousand draw and drawings as part, part of the archives mm -hmm. um, and, and that speaks to the community's strong artistic foundation and you know when you when you just google Cape Dorset and that's really one of the first things that comes up is the art and it seems to me that there's a output of art that is disproportionate to the size of the community uh, that there's so much more art you know per capita than you would expect anywhere else and I'm just wondering you know, obviously there's this print shop and that outlet is a great opportunity, but, you know, what really is it about Cape Dorset that leads to this great artistic output? The cooperative, the West Baffin Cooperative in Cape Dorset was incorporated in 1959. It was one of, it was the first cooperative that was incorporated under a federal government development program called the Cooperative Development Program. The and in the Baffin region, by 1965, there there probably were 20 cooperatives. All of them were involved in the uh, production of arts and crafts to some extent mm -hmm. because the government identified, obviously, uh, indigenous arts and crafts as one um, avenue uh, towards community economic development. The Dorset difference is that the cooperative, both both long-term directors of the cooperative, initially James Houston, followed by Terry Ryan, were artists themselves. Mm -hmm. So their interest was in the arts. Right. And the development of the community economy and cooperative followed that direction from its inception. Mm -hmm. And a sizable infrastructure was built up around the arts in Cape Dorset, specifically the print shops, but also buying carvings from extremely talented people. But their talent was nurtured. 
mm-hmm. and their work was purchased. Mm-hmm. So they had the opportunity to become uh, working artists and sustain themselves from the money that they made from their art. Um, at the same time that development in the north was happening, uh, the co-op developed its own marketing office, mm-hmm. with and originally with the help of the federal government, but then a, a cooperative collective marketing office was developed in Ottawa called Canadian Arctic Producers, and this is the key. This is mm-hmm. you know the vertical integration <laughs> that everybody seeks because you know the north is a long way away, yep. but they had a, a southern wholesale. Uh, distribution outlet uh, for the work that was produced there and gradually built you know a market in Canada and the United States and eventually internationally so mm. it's a fantastic international art success story mm. and what the, the one of the s- uh, stats that you cited downstairs with a quarter of the population involved in some in way. some way in the arts still probably that, that well that was a 2006 study yeah but I think another interesting aspect um, is that Many of the people grow up seeing art being made, and yeah. art being made is part of everyday life. And I think right. that's very different than, the, than how we are raised in the South. Sure. So there's a beautiful drawing in the in the show by Annie Pudigook of her sitting on her bed, of her grandmother's bed, Pitsu Lakashuna, mm-hmm. who's a famous Cape Dorset artist, watching her draw. Mm-hmm. You know, watching uh, drawing being an everyday part of Pitsu Lakashuna's life. And there, are, and, and actually, when I went around later, I didn't realize this. There are many parent and child relationships among the artists in the in the show. So for example, Shuvan Ashuna, who's a really hot artist right now, her father is Kiowak Ashuna, who has some amazing sculptures in the show. That's just one, but there are quite a few examples of parent and child and grandparent and grandchild relationships. So I think the home is really an incubator for art in Cape Dorset in a way that it isn't in other parts of Canada. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's really key, you know, that art is embedded in the culture right. and embedded in the community. Mm. I mean, you know, it's you see people walking to the cooperative to sell their drawings since, you know, the late 1950s. And the cooperative is such a central part of the community and everybody understands that it's not the only thing that the cooperative is involved in, but it's such an important aspect of of what it has contributed to the community, so it becomes like embedded in the in mm. daily life. One of the things that the show does is it tracks a, a shift in the community, uh, and, and f- you know, over the course of the past, you know, what, over fifty years. And I, I'm just wondering, you know, what exactly is that that shift? Well, the the show starts really with the found, founding of the modern community. Mm-hmm. So Leslie talked about these these clan based camps and how people were t- coming into the community in the late fifties, early sixties, right around the time that the co op was founded. So I I don't know if I think it's the shift. The biggest shift happens before the show actually mm-hmm. starts in a way that you know there there's a dramatic change in lifestyle. There's a dramatic change from a hunting based economy to a cash based economy. Um, and there's a dramatic change in terms of housing, uh, what people are eating, what they're wearing, how they're relating to each other, the proximity of the houses. I mean, there are many, many changes. I mean, we can't document all of those changes in art, but of course, because of course, a drawing has to have been made about it for us to be able to right. include it they, in the exhibition. They are there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we did a lot of research trying to find works that documented specific moments. For example, there's one where there's a priest uh, or two priests blessing uh, a couple. And one of the persons is a lay catechist um, who is um, Kanangnek Pudaguk's father. Yes. And so that's an example of a shift in, in the community. So you have cr- the oncoming of Christianity, you have people becoming converted to Christianity and then becoming involved in proselytizing and, you know, in, in the, in the um, workings and operations of the Anglican Church, which was the successful uh, church in in Cape Dorset as opposed to the Catholic. So that's just an example of kind of like a micro shift that happened. Um, But there are many of such moments like that in the exhibition. Mm. Well, there's the one group of four drawings that we looked at that shows the the shift from, I think the first one is it's all igloos in the community and the last one is all houses. Mm -hmm. And the Mm -hmm. four, you know, you said it's part of a larger work and you just selected four that are sort of representative. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you see this change of from this, you know, with no modernization, I guess, mm-hmm. and the, the evolution of the town. Mm-hmm. It's just beautifully done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, the, and, yeah, go ahead. Uh, those are done by, I just want to mention, Itilui, Itilui, yeah. uh, deceased now, part of the archive of drawings that's at the McMichael uh, collection in Kleinberg. Um, but um, 
Yeah, that was part of a larger suite of drawings that uh, documented. I, I think he what he might have been asked to turn his attention specifically to uh, the development of the built community. Right. And uh, yeah, starting out with very simple igloos with the you know the kamotik the sleds, which they used to, you know, put on top of the igloo to uh, keep the meat caches away from the dogs. Mm. Uh, a few you know little uh, buildings there they would have had access to some wood you know from uh, when the, the Scopie sank, for instance, and they raided it for wood when the whalers were up north, and then. You know, coming all the way around to a, a community with a population of about thirteen, fourteen hundred people that's mm. crowded yeah. with houses and overcrowded. Also, when you come in, you come into the gallery, and the first thing that you see in the show, this opening drawing, uh, which is a vision uh, of the the modernization of the town with the the wires and and the growth of it, that accompanies that piece or those four pieces really beautifully and. and I think it goes to show, and I think it frames the show really well because, you know, we were talking downstairs that there's this idea of what the North is that we have. And, and when you're confronted with that immediately, you, you realize that this is, one, is not what the show is about, and two, that's not what the North mm-hmm. really is. And so I think it just beautifully sets up the rest of the show. Mm-hmm. That was certainly one of our goals, was that we wanted to show works that we thought might surprise people and definitely try to uh, stir up their ideas or change their ideas of what they think Kate Dorset looks like. Yeah. If they think about it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, because I, that gets into another issue that we talked about of, I think a lot of the times we group the North together, we lump it together as just the North, even though, as it's defined in Northern scene, the North goes from coast to coast because it's including Northern Quebec and then also in, in parts of Labrador as well. And, we just say, oh, it's the North, but mm-hmm. we don't account for any diversity within that that term. Mm-hmm. And I, we're guilty of it, I think, in a lot of respects with Aboriginal communities, too. We just say Aboriginal, and it applies to everyone, even though there's great diversity within the communities. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how much of the, the focus of the show is to put that individuality back into <clears throat> Northern art. Mm-hmm. Lots. I would think it's one of the main uh, focuses of the show because every community uh, has its own specific history. So the regions have their own history, and within those regions, communities developed differently as well. Maybe even because of something like whether there was a Catholic mission there or an Anglican mission there. Mm -hmm. So even within Nunavut, you will have communities that are... Uh, largely Catholic now, they have a different um, uh, religious framework. Whereas uh, in Cape Dorset, for instance, there was a Catholic mission there, but it never uh, succeeded. It left uh, in the early 1960s, and the Anglican mission became the predominant influence. So community-specific history, but also artistic-specific styles. Um, Every artist... Uh, Inwood artists have tended to be grouped together as a um, almost a generic art form, whereas especially if you look at the work from Cape Dorset artists and have a chance to look at the development of one artist's work over time, you'll see the development of a very specific style, very specific thematic interests that someone else never touched. Mm -hmm. I think that's very clear if you pay attention, you know, to the work in this exhibition. Mm. But the idea of specificity was also quite a strong driver in the works that we selected for the exhibition. So we looked at many, many works for the exhibition, and we would often joke, like we'd look at a work and we would say, too vague. (laughs) So that was one of our key things. So, for example, we didn't want a man, a sculpture of a man and a woman. We wanted a sculpture of some, like a uh, actual named person. So there's a sculpture that of Peter Pitsilak, who's a famous um, member of the community, um, well, no longer living, but holding his camera because he was an early adopter of photographic technology and took many amazing photographs of Kate Dorset and the area. 
Um, there's a sculpture by Uvalu Tunili of her own family. So we didn't just yeah. want a generic family group. We wanted things that we could identify yeah. to specific people. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, in more recent years, portraits of named individuals are becoming more prevalent in the art of Cape Dorset. So mm-hmm. it used to just be, you know, a man or woman or a person in the mm-hmm. landscape. But now there's actually people making portraits, like IT Pudugu, and mm-hmm. we know there's Shuvanai Shuna also doing portraits. So that's an interesting aspect of the more recent development of Cape Dorset. Art. Well, and the autobiographical intent is relatively mm-hmm. new, and that was uh, Annie Pudugu, who yeah. really, uh, she became uh, the first uh, Cape Dorset artist to uh, bring conscious autobiographical intent mm-hmm. to her work. This is me, this is my life, yeah. this is very personal. And uh, she became, I think for that reason, I call her you know, a, the first kind of crossover uh, hit from Kate Dorset, uh, because the contemporary art world was so intrigued with that personal, very specific statement. Mm-hmm. And her work is, I, I don't know if it's jarring, but if, if you have a preconceived notion of what you think Northern art is, it would be jarring, because some of it is her, she, she's drawing in her house, and she shows like her son watching a hunting show on TV, or him playing... Uh, Nintendo, and it's, it's a scene that would go on anywhere in the country, but because it's the North and we have this idea of what the North is supposed to be, mm-hmm. uh, it, it doesn't really fit with what our notions is. And, and there's a, I think there's a beautiful irony in that her, the the drawing of her son watching the hunting show, mm-hmm. uh, because it's what we think people in the North should be doing is just going out and hunting. Mm-hmm. So, you know, within that autobiographical work, uh, it, was there a conscious choice to select things that would challenge the the audience, uh, especially a southern audience. Well, Annie can be much more provocative than the work in this yeah. show represents. <laughs> so not challenge in that way, but perhaps uh, not just in Annie's work, but certainly to cover a, the range of influences that have affected the development of the modern in, uh, community. Some of those are positive influences, but a lot of them are negative. Mm-hmm. So uh, we didn't want to shy away uh, from either, but try to create a kind of balanced look at all of the influences that have affected uh, the development of community. And in that sense, Cape Dorset's history is not unique. Mm-hmm. Right. Those influences have shaped the development of the northern community life, and there are you know, things to celebrate about it and things to, um, you know, uh, be very concerned about. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, though, in the history of Cape Dorset art, there have been some things that have been quite challenging to to the consumers of the art, despite the fact that we would consider them to be very banal things. For example, when Padlo Padlat... One of his drawings in the 70s uh, was made into the print known as Aeroplane that just basically showed a plane. (laughs) That was a radical shock for people born and raised on this idea of the primitive, unchanging north. So Mm -hmm. something as simple as an airplane could be quite challenging in the history of Cape Dorset Dorset art. And, you know, 10 years ago, Annie Pudigou had her first solo exhibition in Toronto at Feely Fine Arts, and she took the art world by storm by virtue of the fact that she was showing basic things like the everyday interior of a house or family life or people having dinner or, you know, these very simple things that we would never even think are that uh, interesting or radical to be content and art. In the context of Cape Dorset, they're very radical and challenging. Yeah, and I think that says a lot more about the attitudes of, you know, of the South towards Mm -hmm. the North than it does about you know, uh, the development of these communities, which has followed a predictable evolution. Right. You know, but the fact that, you know, people have not down here have, whether, like I say, whether they think about it at all, and most people don't, think that this is, you know, surprising or, you know, somehow shouldn't become part of the, uh, you know, the artistic expression is shocking. Hmm. <laughs> We talked about the the airplane uh, drawing. You just mentioned that, uh, Sandra. And I think one of the things that's going on here is there's almost a clash of contemporary and and traditional. Uh, And the one that I think is just beautiful is the sculpture of the kid with his homework walking home with earbuds. And it's a kid who could be placed in any city, anywhere in North America, but because it's cast in... Cape Dorset, again, it has this idea of like, whoa, really? Like, 
like that's not supposed to happen. And, and so it's an interesting message that's coming from this this sculpture. Now I, I'm kind of wondering though about the conflict between traditional and contemporary, and if those two ideas are inherently always going to be in conflict, or can they work together, and, and that we incorporate contemporary ideas into traditional methods, if that's if that's possible. Again, I have to point out how unusual the history of Cape Dorset is. For example, um, the early prints that were made in Cape Dorset are in the medium called stone cut, and lithography was introduced in the 1970s. Is uh-huh. that right, Leslie? But people had already thought that because stone cut was the first printmaking technique used in Cape Dorset, that it became traditional printmaking in Cape Dorset, which is completely bogus. Lithography introduced in Cape Dorset in the 1970s was invented in 1798. I mean, it is not a... Uh, it's, it's an extremely old, long-standing medium in the history of art making in the world. Um, but for some reason, you know, there are certain ideas about traditional and contemporary that are, that are applied to the history of Cape Dorset and, by extension, uh, to the North. Um, I'm always ca- very cautious about using words like traditional and contemporary because I think they, it depends very much who's defining them and, you know, when do we define, like, what, what do we consider to be Southern Canadian traditional culture? What does that mean? Like, why is it, it's very easy for us to try and say, oh, well, you know, maybe it's the late 19, late 19th century that we define as traditional culture for the South Bathon people and then everything else is contrasted against that. But, you know, these are very fluid and evolving concepts mm-hmm. and I'm always I'm always careful about trying not to say, you know, we are evolving and contemporary and people of another culture are traditional and can't evolve. So right. I don't I know if I answered your question, but... <laughs> well, yeah, from the artistic perspective, from the cultural perspective, I'm not sure that there is a clash so much between the traditional and the contemporary because certainly I think a lot of these artists show how how their traditional or how they understand their traditional cultural ways are incorporated in their traditional life but there is certainly a, a disconnect a cultural disconnect in in the communities between the way they used to live and the way they live now but i think that has a lot to do with the trajectory it's just happened so fast mm. we have had you know uh generations to incorporate cultural changes uh, particularly in the realm of technology, whereas we're talking in in the north only I think three generations now from the ni- late 1950s, and and you know what has the, the the rapid cultural change that's happened in the in the span of those three generations uh, has left you know a lot of people literally gasping for breath, and yet it's really remarkable. Um, how uh, how connected the people are to you know modern uh, ways, um, and I mean, they literally you know kind of have a, a foot in both uh, in both places, um, and it's it's remarkable how how many of them manage that so well. Hmm. Now, one of the more powerful pieces, in my opinion, is uh, Ashuna's. Carrying suicidal people, uh, and it's a drawing of two uh, men carrying two women. I believe they're women. Um, I think. I'm not sure. Actually. I'm not sure. Uh, actually or maybe they're either. just, or maybe they're gender neutral mm-hmm. figures. Um, no, I don't think they are. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. So, but they're and, and they're they're deceased via suicide, and the piece really is making a, a strong point about suicide in the north which is a a major societal issue in the region so i'm wondering is the art activists for the community because it's one of the few ways in which people recognize cape dorset and it's it's a major outlet for expression Uh, so not maybe just culturally but also making a political point Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure about that. I, that particular drawing that you're talking about is by Shuvanai Ashuna, and it would be interesting to hear what she actually said about her motivations for making that drawing. It's one of a number she's made on that topic, but there, that's, it's quite an unusual topic for her in her mm-hmm. work. That said, she does have a lot of very kind of frightening and macabre content in her work, not necessarily related to suicide or to contemporary issues. Um, a lot of dreams, dreamscapes, nightmares. Um, so... 
I don't think she's making it with an activist attent- intent. I think that she is documenting something that she has seen or that has been experienced, uh, that she has experienced through people that she knows in the community from a very personal point of view. I don't know, Leslie, what do you think about that? She is, definitely. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very personal statement on her part. But there are other artists from Cape Dorset and uh, other points north who are uh, consciously uh, activist in their work. Oh, Kavavamani. Kavavamani comes to mind. We have one drawing of his in the exhibition. It's not particularly, uh, but he has tackled subjects like uh, environmental change, for instance, in a very subversive, interesting, artistic way. Um, And there are others of the contemporary uh, group who I think... uh, whether they care to really articulate it themselves, uh, use their work as a way of uh, making a political statement about uh, the, the development of the community. Absolutely. And is, that, is part of that then because it, it's a voice? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's an isolated community, and because it's so well-known for its art, the art provides a voice that otherwise the community would not have. Absolutely. Yeah. And ironically, now I think the Southern art um uh, market and um, I want to. I guess I'll say scene. This is northern <laughs> scene would like uh, northern art uh, to become even more political. You know, mm. whereas in the seventies, an airplane was sort of provocative. Right. Those attitudes in the South have all come full circle, and now certainly, you know, contemporary follower, followers of uh, contemporary Canadian art are almost wanting more in the way of uh, political statement uh, from the North. Um, I, I'm not sure, as I said, whether in all cases the artist's intent is directly subversive, mm-hmm. but it, it it certainly can be. Mm-hmm. And certainly we're much more aware, I think, of what the, what the conditions are like. Yeah. For example, in a community like, it's reported in the news, we have the mm-hmm. internet, we, yeah. you know, there's much more travel, people are much more aware, and we, we, we demand to see the reality of the world in this art. We don't mm-hmm. want to see some uh, primitivist, uh, exoticized mm-hmm. view of what's going on in Cape Dorset. Unless it's historical. You know, right. So there certainly is a, you know, a place for that, but in, you know, it, for the art to remain vital, uh, it has to some extent uh, be a reflection of you know, their, their contemporary reality, and it's becoming, it's becoming so more and more. Hmm. And is that, uh, th- that last point that you just made, is that a major focus in selecting the pieces? Uh, is, is this reflection of the, the contemporary daily life? That it be subversive yeah. or that it yeah. simply reflect? Well, both, I guess. I mean, uh, is, was there an effort to be subversive or was it just picking the reflective part of the yeah. community? No, I don't think there was any co- effort to be subversive at no. all, but simply to represent all of the influences mm. and some of those like alcoholism, right. like uh, uh, suicide, um, touch on very contemporary political issues in the mm. North. Uh, right. Yeah. So rather than this broad celebration of the North, it, it's really an identification of daily life. And a very good, good and bad. A complex reality. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not a simplistic place, because like, cause nowhere is. No. I mean, it's a, it's a modern community. Right. And I think, I, was talk to, I talked to Heather Moore on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things she said about the scene generally is that I think people, when they go see it in anything, they'll realize that the North is a vibrant, thriving community with very talented artistic people. And that's really what comes through in the whole scene and generally, but also in this scene, uh, with Dorset mm-hmm. scene. And mm-hmm. uh, th- this vibrance of the community, I think, really comes through clearly. And uh, having walked through it, I think that's a, that, that's one of the things that I'll take away with it, um, apart from just sort of this identification of daily living in Cape Dorset, but also the the, the changing notion or the, the, the that preconceived notions of what the North is. It's not real mm-hmm. as someone who's never been to the North. So it's a, I think it's a, a nice reflection of that. So. Mm-hmm. And the works are amazing. I mean, the artists have made amazing works. So yeah, it's been a privilege to be able to find those and research them and put them together in this exhibition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And put all the conceptual considerations aside and simply look at the skill 
Yeah. You know, um, the aesthetics of it is and the beautiful. aesthetics behind uh, what the artists have done. Mm. Yeah, really remarkable work. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a wonderful show, and I'm thrilled that I got the chance to walk through it. And it's here until June second, so not just through Northern Scene. It's here for a while, uh, so you can come on down, check it out at the Carleton University Art Gallery, which is in the St. Patrick's Building here on campus, which is near the uh, residence. Yeah, it's at the Commons. north end of the campus, parking lot six. There you go. And the beautiful part is that it's free. You can just come on in, check it out, Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 5, Saturday, Sunday, 12 to 5. And you're going to be open late tonight, though, because it's Swarm, and this is one of the stops in the Swarm tour with all the bus people coming in and uh, that's right the so bus people the bus people <laughs> we're uh, open late on friday night at the carl yeah. university art gallery it's, it's gonna be great it's yes. gonna be so much fun i hope so i'm looking forward to it so uh so thanks for doing this i appreciate it so that's uh, sandra dick director of the carlton university art gallery and leslie boyd uh, co-curator of Dorset Scene and co-curators of Dorset Scene here. Uh, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you, thank Sean. You. It so, great. so we will be back tomorrow with another podcast as we continue Northern History Week here at activehistory.ca. Another uh, piece on the website, another podcast. If you have questions, comments for the podcast, historyslamgmail.com, Twitter, at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Check out activehistory.ca for more features and articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes. 